PNR Networks is a member of Patreon. Show your love for our shows by joining our ongoing fundraising campaign and get some fantastic perks in return. Check it out and become a Patreon sponsor. You can sign up at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, backslash PNR Networks. And thanks for your support. Strikes without warning. It is all encompassing. It fills your heart with dread. It's a world remnant with less than special effects, convoluted plot lines, junk science, and rampant overacting. And you're stuck right in the middle of it. Whether you survive or die depends on the writers, directors, FX artists, and more and whether it can be taken as serious cinema or serious cheese. You might even say, it's an utter disaster. You've just been sucked into the Catastrophe Vortex with T.C. Kirkman. Welcome to the first podcast devoted to that most Hollywood of Hollywood movies, The Disaster Film. Hi, I'm T.C. Kirkham, and welcome to the premiere edition of The Catastrophe Vortex. I am quite happy to be actually doing something on my own like this. Um, most of you, if you know who I am, know me from Subject Cinema, or it's a spinoff three-minute weekend, uh, Tuesday Digidex and Front Row 5 and 10. If you don't know who I am... I hope you come over and check those shows out. We'll talk more about those later. But uh, I'm a film buff. I have been all my life. And one of the most important film genres in my life since I was a wee small child has been the disaster movie. I grew up in the 1970s when they were very popular. And since then, I've been hooked on them. It led me to a real-life interest in in, in uh, disasters and how they happened and what they what uh, comprised them and has led me to be a, a, a person who studies real life disasters as well as watching disaster movies. Over the course of the show each week, we're going to deliver three reviews, one of our top grossing disaster films, another film that was in the middle or maybe it was a little gem that nobody noticed, and one of the all-time dregs. Plus, we'll have a few other segments talking about other movies, music, books, and a lot more. Um, I started my fascination uh, with disaster movies when I was in fifth grade. Uh, the first disaster film I ever saw was The Poseidon Adventure. And since that time, I have been hooked on the genre. Um, it is a fun genre, despite the fact that there's lots of human suffering supposedly going on. Mainly because the special effects are interesting, or the story's interesting, or sometimes they're just downright cheesy. Um, in the 1970s, everybody was into disaster films thanks to the success of Airport. And then that led to uh, the Side Adventure and all the Irwin Allen films that led to Direct Like Meteor, um, other, other things, all of which we'll be discussing here. But it's not limited to the 1970s. Disaster films have been around since film began back in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, we'll be covering all those as well. There's more than enough fodder to last us for quite a few shows, I'm sure. Uh, you'll also hear some p personal anecdotes related to stuff here. And each week I'll try to bring you a real-life disaster that nobody's done yet on the big screen, at least not in a big way, and uh, that I think could use a beneficial treatment uh, uh, coming up uh, from Hollywood or from another country, because not all the disaster movies that have been good have come from America. Some of them have come from Europe. A few of them have been have come from Japan when Roger Corman hasn't gotten his uh, scissors on them. And and uh, some of them have been uh, fascinating. Other ones have been so horribly bad that it takes, I, I think even Mike and, or Joel and the bots from Mystery Science Theater 3000 would have trouble getting through some of them. Uh, over the course of uh, the show, you'll be hearing about all of them and my opinions of them, what they're about, why you should look them up, and hopefully... I'll make you a disaster movie buff as well. So let's get started and head off into the vortex with our first major film. It was the film that kicked off the 1970s disaster genre. 
So it's appropriate that it kicks off the first edition of Catastrophe Vortex. Catastrophe Classics. Airport, the year's most widely read novel, becomes today's most exciting, most timely motion picture. Airport, big scale in every way, has the biggest all-star cast ever assembled for a single universal motion picture. Burt Lancaster, Dean Martin, Gene Seberg, Jacqueline Bissett, George Kennedy, Helen Hayes, Van Heflin, Maureen Stapleton, Barry Nelson, Lloyd Nolan, Donna Winter. The pilot from your flight 45 made a shortcut across the field. And he didn't make it. But what are you doing about it? Well, when the snow melts in April, we'll get it out. What the hell do you think I'm doing about it? Outselling any novel of recent years, translated into 14 languages, Arthur Haley's Airport was written for the screen and directed by Academy Award winner George Seaton. It has seven stories tied into one. Dean Martin. It was the film that kicked off the disaster genre in the 1970s. It was the first film of its type to use the Grand Hotel type of casting with multiple stories and multiple cast members that would later go on to form the basis of television shows like The Love Boat. And it was a major box office hit and award winner, 1970s Airport from director George Seaton based on Arthur Haley's 1968 novel of the same name. It's credited by most people for kicking off the disaster genre in the 1970s, which was when it was in its heyday. Uh, the film was actually uh, shot for well under budget. It only cost $10 million to make, but earned well over $100 million. Adjusted for inflation, Airport is still the 47th highest grossing film of all time. That's a pretty amazing thing because at the time, while it was a critically acclaimed film nominated for 10 Academy Awards, including Best Picture, it's kind of fallen off the radar of a lot of today's critics who call it cheesy and uh, garbage and even star Burt Lancaster called it pure junk. Well, that might be, but it is a lot of fun. Let me give you the overall plot of the film. The film all takes place on a snowy night in Chicago. And uh, Lincoln International Airport has been socked in by a major snowstorm, causing all kinds of problems with travel on the air and on the ground. Airport manager Mel Bakersfield has to work overtime, screwing up a, a dinner he was supposed to go to with his demanding wife, Cindy. She's not real happy when she calls him about missing the dinner with she and her father. But he kind of takes solace in, in a friendship with the head of Transglobal Airlines Customer Relations, Agent Tanya Livingston. They are friends. They have coffee together. They talk out each other's problems. In the meantime, the Golden Argosy for Rome, Flight 2 from TGA, as we'll call it from now on, is getting ready to take off. Captain Vernon Demarest, who is normally in charge of the Flight is tonight flying check ride for his friend Captain Anson Harris on this trip to Rome. He's driven to the airport by his wife, Sarah, who happens to be Mel Bakersfeld's sister. They have no love lost for each other, Bakersfeld and Demarest. Uh, Demarest is a by the book pilot who doesn't really put up with any shenanigans except his own. After his wife drops him off at the airport, we later find out that he is having an affair with the chief stewardess on the Golden Argosy flight, Gwen Meehan, who also informs him before the crew arrives that she's pregnant. Dun, dun, dun. During all of this, in the middle of this snowstorm, another plane skids off the runway and gets stuck off of runway 29, referred to in the movie as runway 29 or 29 -er. It's blocking the number one airstrip from uh, landings and takeoffs, and to use 2-2, the smaller one, would take all the planes over a housing development, which have had a lawsuit going against the airport for a number of months about noise pollution. So, Bakersfeld calls TWA and asks to borrow their chief mechanic, Joe Petroni, to come assist them in trying to get Transglobal's plane off of the runway. In the meantime... All things start to come together, and we find out all the different little stories that are taking place. There's one who could be a problem. He's 
an out-of-work demolition expert named D.O. Guerrero. He's down on his luck and has a history of mental illness. He's bought a ticket on the Golden Argosy, unbeknownst to his wife, who still loves him despite all the problems they've had. His wife, Inez, has war- warned him, don't pawn my mother's wedding ring. It's the last thing we have. He stops by the diner where Inez works to say goodbye. She believes he's going off on a business trip, but he has a little bit more sinister things in mind. He's carrying a briefcase with a bomb in it. Once he arrives at the airport, his behavior kind of gives him away. He stops and buys the the insurance that he's going to use that hopefully will give his wife the money she needs to live the rest of her life in peace with coins and small bills, raising the alarm of a uh, very attendant uh, uh, agent. He also mistakes a customs officer for an airline uh, agent, ramp agent, where they take the tickets. They didn't have TSA or any of that kind of stuff back in 1970. The customs agent is also worried about the flight getting off on time because his niece is on board. She's on her way to Rome as well. All of this starts to come together when Inez Guerrero arrives home and finds a special delivery envelope from the travel agency that sold her husband his ticket. She looks through the letter, looks and sees that her mother's wedding ring is missing, and realizes her husband might be doing something desperate to try and get them money. You see, he lost his last job because he misplaced explosives on a construction site. Now, into all this comes a little old lady named Ada Quonset. Mrs. Quonset has uh, been nabbed, stowing away on a recent flight from TGA. She tr- she does this all the time with a variety of different uh, tricks uh, of the trade, managing to fly free pretty much everywhere. Um, she's been caught before. She's used to getting caught. They usually send her home without too much fuss because, after all, she is an old lady, about 70, and uh, she doesn't want the airline to get bad publicity. Well, she also is supposed to be going back to where she came from, but while being attended by the purser who uh, Tanya Livingston has left in charge of her, waiting for her flight back to uh, where she came from, she decides to fake a fainting spell. The purser takes her to the attendant in the ladies' room. He goes off to find more help. She sneaks out and manages to talk her way onto, you guessed it, the Golden Argosy flight to Rome. We'll find out some interesting excuses later. So all of these things have now come together. There's the troubled pilot and and his pregnant girlfriend, the flight attendant. There is uh, the pilot he's testing. There is uh, the elderly stowaway, the mad bomber, and a plethora of irritating people on the 707 Golden Argosy flight. The 707 at the time was one of the bigger planes Boeing had. The 747 had just been introduced and wasn't yet usable for filming. It probably cost way too much money. As uh, Guerrero's uh, desperate moves become begin to unravel with calls to the uh, insurance people and uh, Inez's arrival at the uh, airport uh, running into Tanya Livingston, um, they start to put together a package of her husband and realize he probably has a bomb and he's on the Golden Argosy flight. So they are contacted very carefully by company frequency and Captain Demarest and and, uh, and uh, his, uh, uh, excuse me, Czech Captain Demarest and his Captain Anson Harris both uh, acknowledge that this is going on and decide it rather than try to land in another airport because everything east of Lincoln is socked in from snow with this big storm, they decide to make a slow, gradual turn and head back towards Chicago and hopefully safety for the many passengers aboard the plane. When they discover that the person sitting next to Guerrero is the missing stowaway, Ada Quonset, they put together a ruse and bring her to the cockpit, where the captains tell her, forget what just happened in the cabin, Miss Meehan had roughed her up quite a bit, and ask her for their help. Unfortunately, it doesn't go quite the way they planned. The help is kind of scuttled by a really annoying passenger, and Guerrero is found out. He knows his plot has failed. He jumps, grabs the bomb back from where he was about to hand it to Captain Demarest, jumps in the loo, and blows himself up. And a big hole in the side of the plane. Now, 
It's up to them to get back to Chicago before the plane can fall apart. And whether or not Gwen, who is trying to get him out of the loo, is badly enough injured to hurt her unborn child. She has metal fragments in her eye and a number of other things wrong. Well, they still can't land on 2-2 because Joe Petroni, TWA's crack uh, engineer has been unable to get the the stuck plight that happened at the beginning of the movie off of the big runway. But of course, he manages at the last minute and all is well. Airport is um, one of those films that you either love or you hate. I've shown it to my lovely wife and my subject cinema co-host, Kim Brown. She's not terribly fond of it. But I'll tell you something, I am. I've always enjoyed the performances. I think the story is really good. And I think it doesn't get the credit it really deserves. And the all-star cast is terrific. Starting off with Burt Lancaster, who plays Mel Bakersfeld, the harried airport manager. He does a great job, as does Dean Martin in perhaps the best role of his career as Captain Vernon Demarest. Gene Seberg as Tanya Livingston, the customer relations agent for Transglobal Airways. Jacqueline Bissett in one of her earliest performances as stewardess Gwen Mahan. George Kennedy making his first of four appearances as Joe Petroni. Here he's chief mechanic for the Transworld Airlines at Lincoln International on loan to Transglobal to get that stuck plane out of the way. Petroni will change jobs every single airport sequel, but he will be in all four films. Helen Hayes played Mrs. Ada Quonset, the stowaway. Van Heflin, in his final role, was the failed contractor and bomber, Dio Guerrero. Maureen Stapleton, his wife, Inez. Barry Nelson as the captain of the Golden Argosy flight, Anson Harris. Dana Winter as Cindy Bakersfeld, Mel Bakersfeld's long-suffering wife. Lloyd Nolan as the head of the custom service, who's... Uh, who uh, I, whose suspicions Guerrero raises in in the film? Barbara Hale as uh, Vernon Demarest's sister and Mel Bakersfeld's wife Sarah. Gary Collins plays second officer and flight engineer Cy Jordan, and also appearances by Larry Gates, Jesse Royce Landis, Whit Bissell, Virginia Gray, Dort Clark, Eve McVeigh, Joden Russell, Lou Wagner, and Janice Hansen. The film was shot mostly at Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. There's actually a display in the terminal with stills from the filming and of the stars. And a quote, Minnesota's legendary winters attracted Hollywood here in 1969, where portions of the film airport were shot in the terminal and on the field. The weather remained stubbornly clear, however, forcing the director to use plastic snow to create the appropriate effect. Close quote. The 707 used in uh, the film, ironically, crashed later. Uh, it was uh, at least from Flying Tiger Line at the time, and the uh, airplane crashed while in service with Trans Brazil in the 1980s. Um, this is a, a fascinating uh, look at this first film of the genre. Airport is very much a love boat. It switches from story to story as it goes on. You see parts of the Guerrero story, then you see the captain and, and the captains in, in the uh, cockpit. You'll see what Bakersfeld is dealing with in the middle of a snowstorm. And eventually, all the stories do merge as one on board this flight. Um, it's quite exciting, and people who have seen it, um, at least I know that have seen it back then, rather enjoyed it. It did get 10 Academy Award nominations, winning an Academy Award for the legendary uh, Helen Hayes as Best Supporting Actress. Maureen Stapleton won a Golden Globe for Supporting Actress as well, and it also uh, won a Golden Reel Award from the Sound Editors for Best Sound Editing, and a Golden Laurel from the Laurel Awards for Best Supporting Female Performance by Helen Hayes. It received a Grammy nomination for Best Score Soundtrack. It was the final score written by uh, musician Alfred Newman and did spawn a top 40 hit called Love Theme from Airport, which is the music that's playing in the background as Gwen confesses she's pregnant to Vernon. Um, It was nominated in addition uh, uh, to Helen Hayes' win at the Academy Awards, nominated for Best Supporting Actress also for Maureen Stapleton, as well as Best Production Design, Best Cinematography, Best Costume Design, Best Film Editing, Best Original Score, Best Picture, Best Sound Mixing, and Best Adapted Screenplay for George Seaton. It was nominated for Best Drama at the Golden Globes as well as Original Score and also Supporting Actor for George Kennedy. Uh, as I said, the film is, is one of those that once you see it, 
it's going to get uh, really interesting because it does kind of charge you up to see other disaster films. And as this is, the disaster is actually relegated to the final third of the film here. The rest of it is all set up. You don't really get that much set up on all the ones that come after it. The one, the big blockbusters that were spawned by the su- super success of Airport. Airport holds a special title in the disaster movie icon list because it was the first to really trigger any major success. Despite some disaster films in the past about uh, another airplane film we'll talk about in a few weeks, The High and the Mighty, as well as other films uh, about volcanoes and hurricanes and earthquakes and everything else, Airport was the one that really kicked off the 1970s disaster film. And, you know, it has a very soft place in my heart. It has, I still, to this day, cannot get over what a terrific performance uh, Dean Martin gave in this film. Dean Martin is so well known as the boozy, swishy host of the Dean Martin Comedy Hour for so many years. And, you know, Jerry Lewis, his partner, and doing comedy and, and stuff. He didn't really get into drama until later in his career. And Airport serves as the pinnacle. Although I personally love his Matt Helm films, uh, Airport is by far his best performance ever. If you've never seen Airport, it is available both individually and on DVD in a great package called the Airport Terminal Pack that includes all four airport films, Airport, Airport 1975, Airport 77, and the Concorde, Airport 79. You can find them on most streaming services, and we'll have links in the show notes where you can read about it, watch it, enjoy it, and more. One of the things that fueled my interest in disasters and disaster movies uh, was reading. I love to read, and I used to look forward every month or every three weeks when my teacher would pass out the uh, the pamphlets for Arrow Books. Do you guys remember Arrow Books and Tab Books? That's what was popular back way back when I was you know, before I became ancient. Anyway, um, I used to order all kinds of books from them of all types. And one of the books I ordered when I was in sixth grade was a book called Catastrophe, Calamity, and Cataclysm. It was by James Cornell, and it was called from a larger book called The Great International Disaster Book. It had all kinds of real-life disasters listed in it and how they happened, and that's what fueled that interest in me. Another thing that helped fuel that interest was the first major television show about that. And um, it is, I'm happy to say, I have discovered that every single episode is available on YouTube. The show was called When Havoc Struck, and it first hit in 1978. All of the shows hosted by actor Glenn Ford were recommended by the National Education Association, and each show took on a different topic. Um, in one show, it looked at a number of ship disasters, not just Titanic, but other ones. Uh, in another episode, they looked at bridge collapses, volcanoes. Uh, one show devoted to Hurricane Camille, which was at the time the biggest hurricane to ever hit America. Um, I believe there are 13 episodes in all. The one thing about the, the, um, the, the, the YouTube version is it doesn't have the theme song that I remember when it ran on KHQ TV back in 1978 in Spokane, Washington. I watched it every Wednesday night at 7.30 it was on and I could I didn't miss it ever. Um, and I couldn't believe it when I found all of them on YouTube a couple weeks ago. And in prep for this show, I sat down and watched every episode again. And although they're dated, the facts are all still the same and they're still fascinating. And you can take the time to look at them and enjoy them, or I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but you might get something out of them. Look up When Havoc Struck on YouTube search. We'll have a link to it in our, in our show notes. And um, you can take a look at all these fantastic shows. Over the course of the, of the next few weeks as we go along on the show, I'll be recommending other television programs that focus on real-life disasters and uh, – why I enjoyed them or why I I enjoyed watching them, what I found out from them. And I hope that you will check them out. Some of them are not available anymore, but others are. You can still find a a number of these shows on the air every week, including Air Disasters on National Geographic, known in the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world, as Mayday and airing in Canada. And uh, there's also the best disaster show ever made, uh, which was National Geographic's incredibly informative Seconds from Disaster, which is uh, no longer available, unfortunately. 
Uh, I'll be talking about those in the future as well. But for right now, for real le- learning, if you want to just take the time to sit back and learn about some real stuff that we might be talking about in the future, take a few hours and sit back and watch the 1978 series, When Havoc Struck. Glenn Ford brings the right amount of gravitas to it. As somebody said, it has some of the creepiest incidental music of all time. And they hold up really well. When Havoc Struck, our first Video Vortex show. Disaster Times. Titanic, eine der wirklich grandiosen Schöpfungen des deutschen Filmes. Die frevelhafte Jagd nach einem Rekord, getrieben von Leidenschaft und Liebe, fand mit dem Untergang der Titanic ihr tragisches Ende in den eisigen Fluten des Ozeans. Stellen Sie sich vor, man hat aus der Kabine von Ast noch eine Schmuckkassette gestohlen. There have been numerous films over the years about possibly the best-known disaster of all time, the sinking of the Titanic in 1914. But a lot of people may not realize that there's a lot of conventions that were set up by the very first Titanic film, and it's not a film that most people think of when they think of Titanic. The best-known films in this genre are... The Academy Award-winning Titanic from 1997 from James Cameron, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, there is the 1952 version uh, of the film, which uh, starred Barbara Stanwyck. It was mostly fictional. And there was the British film, A Night to Remember, from the 1950s also, uh, which was the, considered by many the most accurate account of the Titanic sinking. But none of those were the first. The first was actually made for the Nazi propaganda machine. In 1943, the movie Titanic was made in Nazi Germany, originally directed by Herbert Selpin, but finished by Werner Klinger because Selpin fell ill, uh, well, <laughs> he felt victim to Joseph Goebbels. Um, it's quite a fascinating film. It was released on DVD in America in 2012 by Kino Video and is still very much available. It does. It was the first Titanic film made that was simply called Titanic. It was the first to combine fictional characters and subplots with the historical persons and the events of the actual sinking. And both of these ideas became conventions in the Titanic films. I mean, there is no Leonardo DiCaprio among the real passengers of Titanic or Barbara Stanwyck, you know. It's all part of the Hollywood machine. And this film was part of the Nazi machine. It was decided to make this film because he wanted uh, propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels intended to show it not only the superiority of German filmmaking, but also use it as a propaganda vehicle which would blame the British and American capitalistic system as responsible for 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 the terrible disaster that happened. They added an entirely fictional, heroic German officer to the ship's crew, and he was supposed to be the main point of the German audiences uh, could focus on and say, hey, he was brave. He tried to stop this. He did this. He did that. He did not exist, except in the minds of the film writers. Um, Herbert Selpin went way over budget and got in trouble with the Nazis as he filmed it because he complained about the way that the that the uh, army extras were treating some of the people uh, on set. He um, he actually got called into Goebbels' office and would not repudiate, repudiate what he said. So he, um, well, they found him hanged in his cell a couple of days later and the film was finished by Werner, uh, Werner, Werner Klinger. Uh, Klingler, Klingler, excuse me. Um, this film is a pretty amazing film. And when you take aside the fact that it was meant to be a propaganda film for the Nazis, it's actually one of the best Titanic films ever made. Um, it does portray uh, Bruce Ismay, the head of the White Star Line, as a total uh, lecherous, money-grubbing creep. 
Uh, of course, he didn't end up getting any of the blame for it. Um, and it, it does the same for most of the people involved in the upper reaches of the Titanic on the White Star Line. Not so much the crew, though. And, of course, part of the crew, First Officer Peterson, who is German, uh, tries to keep things on an even keel. But, of course, eventually they do end up running into the iceberg, and everybody, you know, goes, or a good half of the passengers went down with the ship. It happened in real life, uh, as, as it happens in all the films. You don't see all the real stories, because not all the stories are real. Most of the ones that come to, t- uh, to the film are fictional, and this is no exception. But it's beautifully shot. Uh, Selpin and Klinger did some t- amazing work most of the film was shot aboard the SS Cap Arcona, one of the truly uh, spectacular liners that Germany had at the time. And uh, there was a story behind that, too. Um, but we won't go into that on this show. It was a very interesting shoot, also. Um, the Allies were bombing not that far away while Selpin was trying to do these rich, immense, beautiful shots of, the, of what was supposed to be the Titanic. And he ended up spouting off and ended up in trouble and dead a few, a few days later. Um, but the look of the film still holds up, and I actually found it to be a fascinating uh, look at the Titanic tragedy. Um, and it does, of course, as we said, play up the fault of capitalism and the stock market uh, all through the character of J. Bruce Ismay and um, makes the Brits and the Americans look totally incompetent compared to the German officer on board. But the film never did make it into general release any more than it possibly could. When Goebbels saw the film, he didn't necessarily think it would be what he had hoped it would be. He would hope it would glorify the Nazi regime. Instead, well, it kind of was a morale sucker. It did air, uh, played, it had a respectable premiere in Paris, uh, Nazi-occupied Paris in, 19, in November 1943, and was pretty well received by the audience, according to those that were there. And it did play a few other capital cities, but it never played in Germany itself. Um, Goebbels forbid it, stating that the German people, who were at the time going through almost nightly bombing raids, would be less than enthusiastic about seeing a film that portrayed mass death and destruction. Um, it was rediscovered in 1949. The Brits actually took three or four snippets of the film and used them in their version, A Night to Remember. And finally, it was restored to full version um, in, uh, in 2005 and shown for the first time uncensored uh, at that time. It was later released on DVD by Kino Video in its original format without all the editing and uh, the censored uh, versions that came out over the years in Europe. Um, it's, it's a pretty interesting film and a different look at the Titanic as it was. The History Channel aired a television special in 2012 to commemorate the release of the DVD called Nazi Titanic Revealed. This is where I first heard of this film, and I ordered it from uh, Kino Lorber. And I have to say, it is a very well-made and well-acted film. As you said, it does have a decidedly pro-Nazi uh, bent about it, which is not really good. But um, it has great writing, good story plot, amazing film work by both directors, and a cast that included some of the biggest stars in Germany at the time. Sybil Schmidt, uh, Hans Nielsen, Kirsten Heilberg, E.F. Furberger, Karl Schoenbach, Thar- Charlotte Thelly, Otto Wernicke, Franz, Sch- I'm going to mess this up, Franz Schaefflin, I believe, Herbert Tide, Sept Rist, Monica Berg, Jolly Bernard, Fritz Botger, Hermann Brix, Lace Lot Klinger, Theodore Lewis, and Carl Meixner uh, were the main cast. And uh, if you've never seen it, you should check around for it because it is well made. And it's a lot of, um, it's, it's like if you've seen the other films, and I've seen, I, I'm ashamed to admit, I've not seen the James Cameron film, and I will in the next few weeks. I'm going to be catching up on them over the, over the course of the next few weeks. But I have seen the 1953 version with Barbara Steinwick and the, the classic British film A Night to Remember, as well as a god-awful TV movie called S.O.S. Titanic from 1979. Um, this is uh, it's way richer in the way that it's shot, the way it looks, and, and uh, the plot lines 
uh, still the the necessary plot lines, the actual disaster of the iceberg and and the sinking, are portrayed fairly straightforward, except for the the the, the insertion of the German officer trying to stop everything from happening. Um, and it is really, really something to look at and look for. Um, you can get it from Kino Lorber Video, and if it is available online, I'm not sure if it's available for streaming, but I will know, and, and we will have a link up to it in our show notes, so you can at least look at it and check out the backstory uh, with uh, information on Nazi Titanic revealed as well. This week's gem, Titanic, believe it or not, from Nazi Germany, 1943. <laughs> Not yet catastrophized. Each week here on Catastrophe Vortex, I'm going to make you aware of a real-life disaster that has not yet been major Hollywood made. There may have been a docudrama about it or something in the past, but... They have never made a big budget film about them, and that's at least that's where I'm going with this. And this particular disaster, I've chosen this to kick off the first show because the 100th anniversary is coming up. It is actually an event that took place here in the Boston area, and it is something that unless you've read about it uh, in the various uh, disaster books out there with uh, small information or you've looked it up online or you've read the uh, book Dark Tide from earlier in the, in the 2000s, you may have never heard of the Great Boston Molasses Flood. Now, this is, uh, that sounds kind of crazy. Uh, it happened in, in what is now known as the North End, which is the wonderfully uh, rich and, and, and vibrant Italian end of Boston with all of these great Italian restaurants and bread shops and gelaterias. Oh, gelaterias in there are great. And all these stores and, and, and bakeries. And it's just, a, it is a major tourist mecca and deserves to be so because you go in there, the food you're going to get, you're going to walk out stuffed and enjoying it. Um, the Great Molasses Flood occurred on January 15th, 1919, when a, a, a large tank of molasses at the Purity Distilling Company suddenly uh, exploded, sending a 35-foot ha- uh, foot tall, I'm sorry, 15-meter tall, 50-foot high tall uh, wave of molasses shooting down the streets of what was then downtown Boston. Um, it happened at 12.30 in the afternoon near Keeney Square. The address of the company was 529 Commercial Street. It's not terribly far from Haymarket Station, one of Boston's main transportation hubs. And for uh, it, it was a pretty devastating event. It, uh, more than a dozen animals were drowned or suffocated in the wave of molasses, which uh, was just kind of crazy. It was forward, going forward at 35 miles an hour out of this tank and reached heights, as, as I said, of 50. Uh, the, excuse me, the, the wave was 25 feet high. The tank was 50 feet high. I'm sorry. The, the um, I mean, can you imagine turning and hearing this noise and turning and seeing this wall of brown goop headed toward you? It was a molasses tsunami. Um, they said that the streets uh, smelled like molasses for decades after the accident and uh, that the harbor was stained brown for months because it all went into the harbor, which is right there at the north end, too. Um, this, th- Strangely enough, this has not yet been made into a film, not yet been made even into a TV special that I'm aware of. If anybody is aware of them, please let me know. You can contact us at CV, that's the letter C, the letter V, at pnrnetworks.com, and uh, let me know. Because, as I said, the 100th anniversary of this, this uh, tragedy is coming up, and I would think that would make a perfect marker for a new film about it. Um, I'm, I'm looking at a map here as I go through, and it shows the map of where the North End is and where the, the cemeteries are and where everything actually happened. And you can actually get a good idea, if you're familiar with Boston, as exactly where this is. Um, it's not terribly far, like I said, from, uh, from, from the area that's still there right now. Um, it's a pretty fascinating story. And if you've never read about it, I urge you to look up the Great Molasses Flood on Wikipedia. And I also urge you to keep in mind uh, and think about an idea of bringing this to the life. After all, there was, as I said earlier, there was a, a book called Dark Tide released in, I believe it was 2004, about the disaster. And there's still memories of it. There is a plaque at the, at the actual 
uh, historical marker, which reads, On January 15, 1919, a molasses tank at 529 Commercial Street exploded under pressure, killing 21 people and issuing a 40-foot wave of molasses that buckled the elevated road, railroad tracks, crushed buildings, and inundated the neighborhood. Structural defects in the tank, combined with unseasonably warm weather, contributed to the disaster. And that plaque is at the entrance to Popolo Park, placed there by the Bostonian Society. Um, and uh, it's also part of everyday life in Boston. Boston hosts this uh, uh, one of the cities in America that has duck tours, these gigantic duck boats. And one of the duck boats that uh, tours Boston every day, painted dark brown, is nicknamed Molly Molasses. It's in mem- remembrance of, of the event. And uh, hopefully, as this first, uh, this, this first de- um, century anniversary comes closer and closer in 2019, we will get a chance to see the Great Molasses Flood on the big screen. Misfortunate Cowboys. isn't just Hollywood that celebrates the disaster in pop culture. It's also music. There's a lot of songs out there that talk about various disasters. And one of the best known was actually written by a songwriter getting this big start in the early 1970s. Now, if you grew up at the time that I did, late 70s, early 80s, from about September of 1979, if you listened to the radio at the time, you could not get away from the song that made Rupert Holmes a household name. The song was called Escape. Most people know it by its secondary title, title, the Pina Colada song. But long before Holmes had that hit, along with him and a few others, he wrote a song about a cannibal, or cannibalism. The song was called Timothy, and it hit the chart in 1970 by a group called The Buoys, B-U-O-Y-S. It was the unnerving story of three men trapped in a collapsed coal mine, and when they're rescued, only two of them are left, and they don't know what happened to the title character, Timothy. Believe it or not, the song was actually a big, pretty big hit. It hit number 17 on Billboard's Hot 100 and uh, also climbed to number 13 on Cashbox Magazine's chart at the time. But it was the only major hit the Bowie's ever had. And it was the first major songwriting success for Holmes, who would go on to write for many artists in the 1970s before finally finding some success on his own as both a performer and later as a Tony Award winning uh, writer of Broadway shows like The Mystery of Edwin Drood. If you're unfamiliar with the story of Timothy, you probably have never heard the Dr. Demento show. The, the song was a regular on that program and tells the story of three miners, Timothy, Joe, and the unnamed singer, who are trapped in a cave-in, and it's sung in the perspective from one of the miners, of course. By the time they're rescued, though, there's only two of them left, and neither one of them can explain what happened to Timothy. They've apparently blocked out the fact that they may have ate him. Um... Naturally, the, the subject matter got them banned from a lot of places uh, at, on radio, but the song proved popular enough for other radio stations to start playing it. The record label, Scepter Records, who released the single, tried to convince the radio stations who banned it to play it again because they were really talking about a mule, not a person. But Rupert Holmes refused to play along with that. Holmes had also produced the tune. And, um, well, you know, the rest is history. It's an oddball song. If you've never heard it, you can find it on most uh, streaming sites online. And you've got to hear it to really get it. Because it's amazing that even with its incredibly goofy lyrics, and I mean goofy lyrics, it's amazing it ever became a pop hit. I mean, it's amazing it ever got airplay. 
It must have taken some gutsy DJs to put it on the air for the first time. And in all fairness, he's got that whole like really dark storyline behind this nice poppy music. It's just kind of crazy. Timothy from 1970 by the Boys are uh, this week's entry into our misfortunate melodies category. Any evacuation. Another non believer. Won't they ever learn? Only this guy's problem is a small matter of a very active volcano. This thing's a powder keg. Well, I think that's a damned irresponsible conclusion on your part. Oh, well, then perhaps there's still time for a little passion in paradise. That's some kiss. Passion that really sparks. But this sucker makes Mount St. Helens look like a kid's sparkler. Oh, man, I think that's a damned irresponsible conclusion on your There was a time when producer already. Irwin Allen could do no wrong. Allen became a major uh, producer player in Hollywood in the 1960s, producing one of the early disaster films, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, in 1960, and later its television series, along with Lost in Space, Land of the Giants, The Time Tunnel, and other television programs. But he hit gold in a big way in the early 70s with The Poseidon Adventure and never looked back. Unfortunately, he probably should have, because by the time we got to 1980s, when time ran out, it had run its course. When Time Ran Out is an all-star piece of direct that if you've never seen, you should, simply because you'll sit and point and laugh for quite a bit of the running time of the film. Um, originally uh, marginally based on the novel The Day the World Ended by Gordon Thomas and Max Morgan Witz, which details the actual volcanic eruption of Mount Pele on Martinique in 1902, in, in, in similarities stop there. It's what we talk about on Subject Cinema, inspired by actual events, without actually being part of the actual event. Um, the movie is set in a resort in, in Hawaii, which is uh, you know starting to gain investors. It has lots of people there. And then, of course, they're not paying attention to the giant volcano that's right behind the major part of the, of, of the resort. Um, it, 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 it's uh, I, I can't describe how bad this film is. Let me give you a quick rundown of the plot. Uh, owner of this brand new hotel, Shelby Gilmore, uh, wants desperately to marry his secretary, Kay Kirby, and proposes to her under the impression that she'll become his second wife. But Kay is still in love with Hank Anderson, an oil rigger, whose scientists are warning him that a nearby active volcano is about to erupt. Shelby's business partner, Bob Spangler, assures guests at the hotel the threat is a total exaggeration. It only erupts every maybe a thousand years. He's married to Shelby's goddaughter, Nikki, but is cheating on her with an executive at the hotel. Um, again, you've got all these different plot lines coming through. Into this mix come a bond smuggler being tailed by a private investigator. Uh, also, a, a retired circus tightrope walking couple, Renee and Rose Valdez, that plays into this big time. And Hank is there working on oil rigs along with his team that includes Tiny Baker, who also has a cockfighting thing going on on the side. I don't quite know what that has to do with the plot. And uh, uh, they have a, a war going with another cockfighting rival named Sam. He and his wife, Mona, own a local bar. All of these people come together when the volcano does erupt. A lot of the island's population is wiped out, and it's along with a lot of the people at the hotel, and it's up to the select few who have been chosen to try and get out. Um, oh, my God, this film is so bad. And, I mean, this is one of the worst disaster films ever made. I'm a fan of Irwin Allen's schlock. And The Poseidon Adventure and The Towering Inferno, his first two big disaster films, were brilliantly done. After that, though, he kept getting worse and worse. He did a whole bunch of TV movies, Fire, Flood, The Night the, Day, the, Night the Bridge Fell Down. We'll get to all of them eventually. And, and I, I swear, they had such a great cast here, and they didn't know what to do with them. Paul Newman as Hank Anderson, Jacqueline Bissett, again, as Kay Kirby, William Holden as Shelby Gilmore, Edward Albert as Brian, 
red buttons as the Bond smuggler, Francis Fendley, Barbara Carrera as Ayolani, Valentina Cortiza as Rose Valdez, Veronica Hamill as Nikki Spangler, Alex Karras as Tiny Baker, Burgess Meredith as Renee Valdez, Ernest Borgnine as Tom Conti, James Franciscus as Bob Spangler, John Considine as Webster, Pat Morita as Sam, Sheila Allen as Mona, Lonnie Chapman as Kelly, Sandy Kenyon as Henderson, Ava Reddy as Dolores, and Glenn Rubin as Marsha. Shot mostly on the at the Kona Surf Resort, uh, now known as the Sheridan Kona Resort, according to Wikipedia. Uh, this was one of uh, Holden's final films. He was he was seriously ill at the time, and Newman, who made a mistake of signing for more than one Irwin Allen film when he signed to do the Tower and Inferno, got stuck in this piece of dreck. Paul Newman usually knew a bad film when he saw it. And unfortunately, he knew this was a bad film when he saw it. The effects are terrible. The volcano effects are cheesy as hell. And I mean, you've got to look at this and say, how could people, I, I didn't see it till it came on cable a year later. How could anybody pay money to see this direct at the theater? How indeed, I, as I said, I didn't. Um, it has the distinction of being named a Dog of the Year by Siskel and Ever in 1980, and it still managed an Academy Award nomination for Best Costume Design. There are several different prints out there. It has aired on television under the title Earth's Final Fury with a bunch of extra footage. That extra footage has been re-sliced out for the DVD version that's available through Netflix, and you can also order it through, uh, actually order the DVD through Amazon, and um, or actually stream it also from Amazon. And and it is, um, <laughs> oh yeah, um, it's fun to watch strictly because it's. It's definitely a movie I would love to see show up on the new version of Mystery Science Theater 3000 that's coming out, or maybe with Mike and, and Bill and Ted, uh, Bill and uh, Bill and Ted, Mike and Bill and Kevin on the Rift Tracks Live series. It is a terrible, terrible film, overacted to the nth degree, particularly by James Franciscus. The the weird thing is, I'm a big fan of his. James Franciscus did all kinds of great work in television and the movies in the 1970s and 1980s. One of the best was his short-lived series called Longstreet in the mid-1970s. But here, he's so over the top that it's ridiculous. Every scene he does, he's chewing scenery worse than Charlton Heston does in Earthquake and Airport 75, which I didn't think was possible. Um, you got to understand, uh, this was at the very end of the cycle. 1980 pretty much called it quits for the main group of disaster films. All within a year period, we got The Swarm, Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, and When Time Ran Out, all from Irwin Allen, we got the god-awful uh, Airport 79, The Concord, uh, from Airport uh, producer Ross Hunter, and a bunch of bad TV movies from Irwin Allen, and they all combined to help kill off the cash cow that the disaster was at the time. Now, as I said, it is worth the time to watch if you've got two hours to sit back and just point and laugh. Get yourself a drink, soda, alcohol, whatever you want to do. If you're drinking alcohol, drink responsibly. And don't don't start any drinking games with this because you'll be drunk before the end of the first half. Um, there is um, so much wrong with this film that it, it makes it enjoyable to watch just on a bad film level. Uh, and it's a shame because so many good people are wasted. The highlight of the film to watch for is near the end of the film. At this time, it is they're getting away from it. The, the survivors are getting away from the volcano. The resort's already been destroyed. And one of the survivors, Renee, one of the tightrope walkers, loses his wife. She can't go on any further. And, and he's heartbroken. But there are two kids that are part of the survivors, and he is determined to make sure those kids get to safety. So he uses his skills as a tightrope walker to walk across this dangerous river of lava about 20 feet up from where it's going underneath this bridge that has collapsed, and walks them both to safety. Not only are the effects laughably bad in this scene, Burgess Meredith, who is just one of the best character actors ever, manages to make you enjoy this character's performance 
all the way through it. He's the only person in this entire film that makes it worth watching, uh, at least on a reality level. When Time Ran Out was released in 1980, it was a box office bomb. It earned only $3 million at the box office on a budget of, I think, $40 million, something like that. And, and um, $20 million to produce. It earned a measly uh, three three point seven million at the box office, and uh, when you see it, you'll probably figure out why. So you know, just kind of sit back, chill out, and remember the day when time ran out. And believe me, it won't run out fast enough for you. <laughs> One of the other things I'm going to be doing on Catastrophe Vortex every week is bringing you some reading material. I've got tons of books on disasters. Some of them are about the making of the films. Some of them are about actual disasters. Some of them are anthology books about them. Um, the, one of the best is no longer in print, and that's The Great International Disaster Book by James Cornell. Um, the last update was done way back in the 1980s, and I'd love to see it revised. You can find it if you look around on eBay and a few places. I did. I found a, a new copy of it. Um, but... Uh, it has um, little capsules of some of the worst disasters separated by the type of disaster that happened. Shipwrecks, fires, bridge collapses, dam bursts, and stuff like that. It's well worth it if you're actually into the science of how these things happen, what kind of conditions caused, like, say, the St. Francis Dam in uh, uh, the in uh, Los Angeles to collapse or, you know, a particular accident from an airline. Um, it's a fascinating look. And every week I'll have links in the show notes where you can go over and check these out on Amazon or Amazon Kindle. And I hope that you will take advantage of that. I'm always happy to give you great material because, as I said, I'm fascinated by the subject. And I hope you will be too. This week's Spotlight book is actually not about disasters, but it takes its name from a disaster. And the cover is a shot from one of the most infamously bad disaster films of the 1970s. The movie, the, the book is called The Stewardess is Flying a Plane. And it's all about cheesy 1970s films with a um, segmented, sharded, fractured photo of Karen Black from Airport 1975 on the cover because that's Sid Caesar's line in the film. When they find out that there's been an accident and, you know, the, all the pilots are out of permission and the stewardess is flying a plane. Well, you know, it's worth finding if you can still find it and uh, a lot of fun. And it covers every genre from the 1970s, including the disaster film. And I hope you'll check it out. And now a quick story. There's something really nice about being able to sit down to dinner and enjoy a good music show with your dinner. Um, we attend a great film festival every year, except this year apparently, because of circumstances and reasons. We can't get to the Salem Film Fest this year. But we have this little favorite restaurant right near the venue where the, where the films screen called the Village Tavern. The Village Tavern is a great atmosphere. It's family atmosphere. If you go in in the wrong time, it's, it's swamp. One of the years we went in, about two or three years ago, we went in on a Saturday afternoon before they got really busy, and they had a duo playing acoustic songs. And we sit down and we order our food. And it's like, you know, we always love the food here. It's a great place to eat and terrific prices, great staff, some of the best potato skins on the planet. And we're sitting there and we're talking about the movies that we've seen at the fest and what we've got coming up in the fest, because this was like a couple of days before we left. And, you know, we were listening to the music and they're playing Scarborough Fair uh, by, you know, um, by Simon and Garfunkel. And they're playing all these folky songs. And we're sitting there and our, our appetizer has arrived and we're taking a drink. And I'm taking a drink of my soda and, and t talking with Kim. And I hear, <laughs> I hear something I never would have expected to hear as dinner music. As the man... Start singing, the legend lives on from the Chippewa on down on the big lake they call Gitchagumi. The wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. I nearly busted a gut. We were sitting there and I, I almost did, I, I swear to God, I almost did a spit take. The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald is the most infamous disaster song of all time. 1976, number two hit for Gordon Lightfoot. And, and, and it... You know, it's a great song, 
People make fun of it all the time. I think it was Kevin Meany that used to make a, a great deal of, or Kevin Pollock, one of the Kevin's comedians, used to make a great, had a great routine about, about, about the, the song. But as dinner music, um, I'm like, really? Kevin and I could not stop laughing. We laughed all, I mean, the song is not something you want to laugh at. If you get caught laughing at somebody playing the record of the Edmund Fitzgerald, you're going to be like, oh my God, how crass can you be? But, you know, we're sitting there waiting for our main meal to arrive, and these guys are singing this. And we're not the only ones. The people over at the bar, a few feet away, were snickering, looking at the... At the and it, it seemed to me, they said, uh, I think they... I, I remember, do seem to remember saying that it was a request from somebody. I'm like, are you serious? The wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald is not the best dinner music in the world, believe me. That's going to do it for this weekend, this week's first edition of Catastrophe Vortex. Over the next few weeks... As we start to feel out everything and get everything into place, I know the show is going to come together uh, bigger and better and more fun every week. Check out our show notes, my show notes. I don't know why I keep saying our. Kim is not part of the show. Um, check out the show notes on the website and uh, be sure to take a look at the website. It's at catastrophevortex.com and you can subscribe to the show um, from there and it will be available in the first week on iTunes and all of our usual outlets, I'm sure. And... Um, we hope that you'll be there, and, and we hope that you will listen and enjoy the show. Um, we ask that you check out the rest of our programming. I host a great show, as I said, with my wonderful wife, Kim Brown, called Subject Cinema every Sunday evening. It's all movies, fun, games, uh, and, and a, lot of, a lot of laughs, we hope, and we hope you'll check it out, as well as Subject Cinema's three spinoffs, our list program, Front Row 5 and 10, every Thursday evening, uh, and our two mini podcasts, Tuesday Digitex, running down the new DVD, Blu-ray, and streaming releases every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern and Three Minute Weekend, which is usually actually about seven minutes, um, every Friday at 10 a.m., running down that week's releases in theaters all over the U.S. Plus, there's other shows on PNR Networks as well, including Kim's show, Platinum Roses Garden, all about the television series Supernatural. You can find it at PlatinumRosesGarden.com. And K Babble with Eric and Valerie Lyon, which you can hear at KBabble.com. It's another show about movies, games, TV, odd things to eat, and a lot more. And all of our shows on PNR Networks you can find at eCinema1.com, except Catastrophe Vortex, which is here at CatastropheVortex.com. It's going to be an interesting experience, and I hope as I continue to do this every week, it continues to get your interest and continues to educate you, not just about real-life disasters, but about the wonderful, incredibly cheesy Hollywood art form known as the disaster movie. Until next week, when I invite you to come back and get catastrophized one more time, I'm T.C. Kirkham. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Podcasting's choice from coast to coast, continent to continent, right here 24 7.